Praise God, I'm sure. Many of us have had situations in our lives and we have experienced God's greatness. We have experienced God's faithfulness. We have experienced the power of God. Put your hands together and clap unto the Lord. Great is thy God. Yes. Great is your faithfulness to me, Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. While we're standing, if we could just have a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, we thank you for your movement in this place. We thank you for your spirit, for we sense that you are among us, and we thank you for what you are doing, even in this moment. Great you are. Great is thy faithfulness. Your mercy, your mercies are made new every, every morning. And God, we thank you. Now we ask to ready our hearts. God, let your word go forth. Let your word fall on good ground as a seed that is planted and in its own time bears an increase. So God, I ask in this moment that I decrease, that you might increase. You speak the word, what you have to say to your people. And so we thank you, God, not only for what you're going to do, but for what you're doing right now in our lives and in our communities. And we give you praise, honor, and glory, and we consider it done. In Jesus' name, in victory's name, and the body of Christ said amen. Put your hands together one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may have your seats. I first wanted uh, to take the time to give honor uh, to whom honor is due. So first I wanted to thank uh, quickly is becoming my brother and my good friend, the Reverend Starsky Wilson, for inviting me and trusting me uh, with his pulpit. And I'm so grateful for the witness that he embodies, not only in this local community, but also nationally and even globally. And I would be remiss, I also am grateful for Lady Latoya Wilson. I'm just so grateful for meeting some folks in the St. Louis area, so if I'm in the space, I can come by, right? <laughs> like family. But I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for everything that I've learned at this conference over the last three or four days. And I do want to say uh, that if you were not at the conference, you really do want to purchase, I believe, um, various sessions because the conference was quite powerful about how we can think about our leadership in the 21st century. And in particular, what I loved about the conference, which brings me to what I will be sharing with you briefly on today, is the idea that Jesus and justice, these two things are not opposite. They're not antithetical. That justice is central to how Jesus understood his ministry and his witness. And so the question becomes, as Jesus followers, as Jesus' disciples, what are we being called to now as Christ's hands and feet in the earth? And so I'm very grateful that this leadership, this leadership conference addressed that. So now if you will go with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. I don't know what's normally practiced in your church, but if that's the stand during the reading, then I invite you to do that. Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. I am reading out of the NRSV. Luke 18, 1 through 8. If you have, you can say, God, if you don't say, hold up. <laughs> okay, let's read together. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, grant me justice against my opponent. 
For a while he refused, but later he said to himself, though I have no fear of God no, and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says, and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? I would like to take as a sermon title on this morning, Just Call Me Nasty. Just Call Me Nasty. You can have your seats. can sense from the laughter that many of us recall the moment Donald Trump said a particular line, a line we as a country will never forget. In the final moments of the presidential debate as Hillary Clinton was answering a question about how she would raise taxes on the rich to help the middle class, Trump interrupted her and said, such a nasty woman. Now, to be sure, that was not a compliment. In fact, his statement was meant to be disparaging. For Trump, nasty is meant to evoke being evil, malicious, criminal, immoral, revolting, disgusting, repulsive, and unuseful. Nastiness is a linguistic site for shame. Being termed nasty is like wearing the proverbial scarlet letter upon one's identity, which is used to announce to others that you are not worthy or fit to exist or lead. Well, we now know the story that many in the country did not accept his definition of nasty. I mean, people, both men and women, decided to call themselves nasty if nasty meant someone who has the nerve to talk back to injustice, persons who refuse to stay in their place, people who are willing to call out lies, folks who will not be manipulated by the status quo, folks who will not back down from unjust authorities who desire to have the last say. In other words, people around around the country were simply shouting back to Trump, just call me nasty. Well, in our text today, this morning, Jesus tells a parable of one particular woman, an unnamed widow who is what we might call a nasty woman, as she courageously and unapologetically demands justice and demands that her agency and humanity be taken seriously. Now, I want to pause here because I'm foremost a teacher, okay? So if we can think of this as a classroom for a moment, because I, I, I think it's important for us to understand the way in which this widow proves to be nasty and unconventional. It's important to note that there are conventional images of widows in the Gospel of Luke where we find this parable. As scholar of Christian origins Amy Jill Levine notes, the writer of Luke attempts to fit this widow into his conventional image of widows. See, the first widow we meet in Luke, if you remember all the Bible students, is Anna, right? who is the 84-year-old widow who never left the temple but worshiped there with fasting and prayer day and night. And Anna sets the agenda for Luke's widows. Anna pra uh, prays and fasts. She does not, however, speak. She does not engage the public. She will not cause any trouble. Now, from Anna, Luke reminds the reader of the many widows of Israel who were starving underneath the Roman imperial order. And Luke also follows that up with widows, as we all know, who mourn the death of their loved ones. If you remember the death of Tabitha in Luke 9, widows were mourning her death. Moreover, Luke echoes the writer of Acts, in which widows were often overlooked in the early churches daily distribution of food. In other words, widows were victims. 
Widows in ancient Palestine were treated as marginalized subjects, property beings, and marked bodies. Widows were often exploited as their survival depended on the men. But what's most important for what we'll be talking about today is that throughout the Torah and prophetic writings, the widow does not plead on her own behalf. That is the responsibility of the community. And we see commands to plead and care for the widow in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, Malachi, even in the book of Job. So then before the parable of this widow, this unnamed widow, widows in general were described in conventional ways in Luke, a way of discussing women without voice or power, women who simply depended on the community to speak on their own behalf. Well, Jesus likes to shake things up. Jesus presents a parable about an unconventional, unnamed widow. And to be clear, parables are not just stories. They are stories designed to shake up one's worldview, to question the conventional. So in order to question the conventional understanding of widows who simply pray and mourn their lot in life, allowing others to speak on their own behalf, Jesus offers this parable of the unnamed widow. And here's the powerful part. Jesus presents this widow less in the traditional sense of a widow on her knees and simply praying, not in public. Jesus presents a widow more the image as a woman with a fist as she prays. A woman with a fist as her prayer. A woman with a fist who pleads on behalf, on her own behalf, in the most public and scandalous way. It was scandalous because women could not appear in courts. That was seen as inappropriate. This parable offers us deep insights that I believe are important to us, not only as Christians, but as leaders on how we model our lives like the widow who decided to be nasty, who decided to be unconventional, putting herself on the line and confronting injustice wherever it may be. So what does this parable of the unnamed widow teach us about our call as leaders, particularly as we've been reflecting uh, on this for the last three or four days. The first insight, I think, is present. This narrative of this unnamed widow teaches us that prayer and protest go hand in hand. In fact, this widow demonstrates that protest is a form of prayer. Now, th there's an interesting theological turn in this text because this parable begins, if you read that first verse, this parable begins with likening this widow's protest actions to prayer. Think about that. The parable begins with likening this widow's protest actions to prayer. I would imagine that this is counterintuitive to the ancient hearer Jesus is speaking to because prayer was something done in the temple. Particularly when it came to women, prayer was something done in private. But I would also propose that this is counterintuitive to our culture today as prayer is seen as a spiritual practice that is otherworldly in contrast to protest and direct action that is seen as something, you know, that we simply do in the secular fear, sphere. Prayer is seen even as weak, seen as an opiate of the masses to keep them from rising up and acting. And the church world tends to not get it right as well because political action or protest is denounced in favor of prayer. In church, prayer is seen as that which connects your inner self to God. Prayer is described simply as the inward journey. In other words, protest is seen as an option to one's Christian identity or spiritual walk, right? So that protest is seen antithetical to prayer. People will say, quit trying to do God's work. Let God be God. In other words, don't do what God needs to do. Protest then is seen not as necessary as prayer is. Well, 
This parable throws all of these assumptions into question. The widow in the parable teaches us that prayer and protest are not two different things. The, this widow in the parable shows us that prayer at its best is action. Prayer at its best is protest. Prayer is only for the strong as it requires us to act on the faith, faith we profess. Prayer means that we wrap our flesh around what we profess. Prayer is incarnational. So in this text, prayer is not an opiate for the masses. It is not the kind of prayer to passively sedate our spirits. It is not the kind of prayer to enlarge our bank accounts. It is not the kind of prayer to enlarge our territory. Not the kind of prayer to secure material blessings for me, myself, and I. This is a thy kingdom come, thy will be done kind of prayer. This is a if God be for us, who can be against us? That's community. It is no weapon formed against us shall prosper kind of prayer. This is a though justice delays, it will not be denied kind of prayer. This is a prayer for world changers. Are there any world changers in here? This is a prayer for action. And in this text, Jesus is challenging, challenging the hearers to rethink how we pray to rethink what prayer is, what prayer is. This widow just doesn't speak prayer, but decides to perform, embody, or incarnate prayer. Incarnating prayer is about allowing our prayers to have hands and feet in the world to enact justice with God. Incarnating prayer is about refusing to let the status quo have the last say. Incarnating prayer is about choosing to be in the Jesus movement that privileges the downtrodden and dispossessed rather than subscribing to the trumped up Trump style Christianity. We must re-educate ourselves and relearn what prayer is all about. And at its best, Prayer is righteous and just action. In other words, prayer is protest. But then there's a second insight, and this is where it gets really, really, really tricky, maybe even provocative, might even anger some folks. But we're going to wrestle with this on today because it sits in the text. See, it's in the text, y'all. It sits in the text. So I'm just, I'm just talking about the text because it's sitting in the text. In this parable, this theological term, of connecting prayer to protest also presents a theological dilemma. There is a theological dilemma in this text, and I believe that this parable presents a tension that cannot be easily resolved. Don't have answer for it, but it cannot be easily resolved, but I think it can teach us something. The parable shows that this widow is willing to attack the judge if her request went unmet. I'm going to prove it. How can it be that the very passage, the passage that Jesus lifts up the parable in of the widow as a model of prayer, Jesus lifts up this widow as a model of prayer. How could it be that simultaneously this widow will potentially resort to violence if her demand is not met? So let's go to verse 5. In verse 5, within the NRSV in particular with the language it uses, biblical scholar Conrad Weiss argues that the judge's internal comment of the widow not wearing him out, remember that? Not wearing him out. It corresponds to a boxing term in Greek. The phrase wear me out means to beat up, to strike me in the face, to do violence to me, or to give me a black eye. The text reveals that the widow was not operating with a politics of respectability or even a pacifist politic. 
She had a Malcolm X faith, faith by any means necessary. But before I go there, how in the world do we grapple seriously with this text? A parable that Jesus privileges about a widow who is clearly a courageous model of resistance standing for justice, but who will overtly employ violence if she needs to. What do we do with that? I believe that this parable shows us that unjust systems which constantly create violence tend to reproduce a sense of trauma in those who feel the weight of injustice. Systems of violence often have a way of sucking everyone in due to the pain and the wounding of violence. This widow had been traumatized, y'all. And I want to note that in many biblical commentaries, they insist that in Jewish society, a widow had no legal rights to her dead husband's estate. And so the widow would often be forced out of her house on the streets where she had no choice but to beg. So it is understood among biblical scholars that perhaps this was this widow's predicament. This was this widow's circumstance. And if so, why wouldn't she be fierce? Why wouldn't she be tired and angry? In other words, why wouldn't she be nasty? Why wouldn't she be? But don't judge the widow. Don't judge the widow because she is attempting to reclaim her agency and humanity within a system that refuses her request for justice. Her request is simply to be treated like a human being. And as Victor Hugo powerfully stated, the guilty one is not he who commits the sin in the dark, but he who causes the darkness. The impulse is for us, this is our impulse, let me say, this is my impulse. The impulse is for us to judge the widow for her approach. She's being violent. She's being kind of crazy. You know, we want to, we wanna, you know, have some sense about us that shows we're willing to be cooperative. No, 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 no. This impulse, we judge her because of her approach without judging the source. The source being an unjust system without judging those who create the darkness. The judge represents evil, institutional corruption, and the text lets us know that. Remember, the judge doesn't grant her request out of his sense of justice or goodness. Remember, he says, I have no fear of God or of other people in the text. He grants her her request because the widow was unrelenting and he felt threatened and forced by her courageous approach to give her what she asked for. Now I want to pause here because part of the complexity of the historical record in terms of the black freedom struggle movement, people like James Cone talk about this extensively in their literature, is that the civil rights movement would not have been po possible without the black power movement. Martin Luther King would not have been possible without Malcolm X. One of the reasons, the biggest reasons why, amen, one of the biggest reasons why is because in a lot of ways, the unrelenting, the unrelenting fight that the black power movement, Malcolm X and others had by any means necessary, that scared society, that scared the white supremacist structure, and that caused them to say, look, we have to do something and we have to talk to somebody. So if we're gonna talk to somebody, then we better talk to King, who is saying that he'll be nonviolent. This is the complexity of the historical record. And so I'm not trying to condone violence. I wanna say that. I'm not trying to condone or promote violence. But this parable, as the historical record, is meant to disturb. It is meant to disturb how we morally evaluate people, who is right and who is wrong, who is in and who is out, who does not deserve God's grace and favor and who does deserve God's grace and favor. This parable invites us to walk in this tension, 
into this liminal space, sit here, live here, live inside of people's pain, understand the exhaustion and the trauma and the anger and the brokenheartedness people endure before we assess what people should do or should not do. In other words, what I'm saying is this. This parable invites us to exercise empathy. Empathy is often not seen as, morally speaking, as part of the gospel call. Because from a moral perspective, as an ethicist, uh, at, from a moral perspective, what we often want to do is we want to resolve the moral tensions that are present in people's lives. But what does it mean when the gospel calls us to not feel as, feel as if we have to go in and immediately make things right, but go in to listen deeply, go in to exercise empathy, go in to hear people's narratives and stories of pain and brokenheartedness and abandonment. What does that mean? Because after all, that was Jesus's witness. He went and sat with people. He dined with people. He came into profound intimacy with people so that when people walked away from Jesus, they felt a sense first, not of belief, but belonging. What does it mean when we practice and preach a gospel of belonging. I want to be able to go out and make people feel as if they belong, as if they're a part of the beloved, as if they are the head and not the tail. I want people to know that all you have to do is recognize that God will do anything that you ask. I want people to know that. And even in our communities, we look at young black folk, the soul murder they constantly fight against a violent system that refuses them proper education, criminalizes them from birth, robs them of basic respect on the streets, and then we wonder why their response is righteous indignation and anger. But let's not judge our young folks. Let's not judge them or write them off. We must go deeper and acknowledge and work against the structures that create the darkness, structures that reproduce anger in individuals. We must exercise empathy. And I am grateful that Jesus did not count this widow out. Out because of her anger. Out because, yeah, she would have got bowed it. I just said bowed it. Yes, I did for those that bowed it. Yes, because she was ready to do anything by any means necessary. Because here's the key. Her cause and her demand for justice was right. Her holy goal was ultimately to give injustice a black eye. This is the gospel according to Black Lives Matter, that we should exercise empathy and sit with people to show people the glory, the presence, and the love of God. But here's the key. This is the last point. I'm going to take my seat. But this is not the end of the story. Glory be to God about prayer and justice. The story doesn't end with our actions alone. At the end of the parable, Jesus asks the how long question. He asks, when the Son of Man comes, will he find this kind of faith, the widow's kind of faith, on the earth? Mm. In other words, Jesus asks, will there be someone audacious enough to actually ask and believe for a better world? Will there be a group that refuses to confuse the world's no to justice with God's radical yes to justice for the least of these? Will we truly believe that our prayer and protest matter and will we wrap our flesh around what we profess about what God is and what God can do? Will God find folks who will not lose heart? Will the Son of Man find anyone as bold, courageous, womanish, and nasty as the unnamed widow? The parable teaches us that God will hear our cries and vindicate our holy cause. We do not walk alone. 
God will respond to our cries for deliverance. God will co-partner with our cause. But we must pray, protest, and not become weary, not give up. We must do our part and trust that God will do God's part. Now let me take it here because I grew up in a Pentecostal tradition. And growing up, the church mothers would say, whenever we got weary, baby, keep on keeping on. When you felt discouraged, they would remind you to keep on keeping on. When you felt alone, they would remind you, baby, just keep on keeping on. When you were not sure about what tomorrow would hold, they would just tell you to keep on keeping on. When funds were low and opportunities were few, they would just say, baby, just keep on keeping on. That was not a statement of our power. That was a statement of God's power. That God will do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can imagine, ask, or think. According to the power that worketh within us. Keep on keeping on. We have many unjust judges. We have so many unjust judges and rulers and institutions today who do not desire to put the needs of people first. But as I go to my seat, I am reminded of the wisdom associated with a mantra out of one of my favorite movies, Oprah Winfrey, produced it, and Denzel Washington starred, you gotta say Denzel, Denzel, you gotta say Denzel like that, Denzel Washington starred in it. Denzel starred in it, and Oprah Winfrey produced it, but it's called The Great Debaters for those that watched it. But I appreciate Rev, the mantra that is in that movie about what it means to think about God as the ultimately just judge who will come and answer our cries and prayers. It was a mantra in the form of a call and response. The coach would ask a question and then the teammates would respond emphatically to him. So this is the way it began. began. The coach would say, who is the judge? And the teammates would say, God is the judge. And the coach would ask, and why is God the judge? And they would respond, because God determines who wins and who loses, not my opponent. And then the coach would ask, and who is your opponent? And they would respond, he doesn't exist. And he would ask, and why does he not exist? And the teammates will respond, he does not exist because he is merely a dissenting voice of the truth that I speak. So I say to you, speak the truth. Although there are evil powers in high places, speak the truth. Although it sometimes seems like we're fighting in vain, speak the truth. Although our hearts may go weary, speak the truth. Although we may feel our cries go unheard, speak the truth. Speak the truth. Speak the truth, brothers and sisters. Speak the truth. Speak the truth, and God will have our backs. Yes! 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 Speak the truth. Speak the truth. Speak the truth, and God will have our back. Don't get weary. Don't get tired. But speak the truth, 